I'm wearing glasses today. But even I couldn't see what was going to happen to the Mets, Cardinals, and Padres this season. You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your glasses wearing host, Paul Francis Sullivan, but please, by all means, call me Sully. I'm an Emmy nominated television producer who has been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade. And this is my fifth full season here at the Lockdown Podcast Network. Uh, follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow me. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to us on the YouTubes. And this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on the journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnMLB today to get 10% off of your first month. Also, Bird Dogs is a sponsor today. Go to BirdDogs.com slash LockedOnMLB. At the promo code LockedOnMLB, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti-style tumbler with every order. I would like to consider myself a Yeti-style tumbler. And I'm here for every order. Hey, a um, lot of stuff to discuss. You can tell we're going to be talking a little bit about the Mets, Cardinals, and Padres as they face their next 100 games. And it's gut check time for them. Yes, I know 100 games is more than half the season. But we're going to talk a little bit about what they have to do to get themselves off the mat. Also, uh, yesterday... Millard Thomas and I put on a clinic of why you can't record a daily podcast too early. And the person who I felt probably should have won the Cy Young Award last year and the person who did win the American League MVP last year are currently sidelined for very, very different reasons. Let's head to the trivia question first. Hey, I am detecting a pattern. And that is Craig Brindle, one of my listeners and an everyday Sully. Good to have you aboard. He got the trivia question first, so let's get on it, folks. Craig is, uh, you know, boxing you out. Actually, he hasn't gotten every single one, but I asked in 2001, the Diamondbacks rode Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson to the World Series title. Who were the other three pitchers who started games in that postseason for the Diamondbacks? They were Miguel Batista, Brian Anderson, and Albi Lopez. By the way, all those pitchers also threw in relief at one point or another. It truly was, you know, it, it, the Boston Braves in 1948 famously had Johnny Sane and Warren Spahn as their aces, and the rest of the pitching staff was garbage. And the the refrain in Boston in 1948 was, uh, Spahn and Sane, then pray for rain. In other words, these are only two uh, pitchers on the team, and then the other pitchers were so bad, you want a rain delay to delay it. Uh, later on, in I believe it was 1988, when the Morgan Magic Red Sox were there, and uh, Bruce Hurst was an all-star pitcher for the Red Sox, and Roger Clemens, uh, he he did not win the Cy Young Award that year, but he had was coming off back-to-back Cy Young seasons, had another fine year. Uh, I think it was Dan Shaughnessy he tried to revive the Spawn and Saints Pray for Rain rhyme by saying Clement and Her- Clemens and Hurst, then expect the worst. Well, it was uh, Schilling and Johnson, and then it was tough to pray for rain when the uh, <laughs> Diamondbacks play in the dome. But there you go. Good job, Craig Bruno. I got a trivia question going on. That will be on the third segment for today. So if you want to hear the trivia segment, please listen to the end. And then if you get the answer, post it. I'm going to make it a little challenge. I, I picked one that I did not know going into this one. Hey, um, let me address the glasses. I am wearing glasses. I am 51 years old. I'm closer to 100 than my birth. Uh, 51 years old means one third of my life is over. Uh, as I was putting the, today's podcast together, 
Uh, I wear these glasses a lot of times when I read or use the computer, and I found myself focusing, refocusing, focusing, refocusing. And I thought, hey, Sully, salvation for your eyes is within arm's distance. And I grab my glasses and put them on, and like a miracle, everything's clear. Well, I see clearly now. I did not see clearly at the beginning of the year. If you made predictions at the beginning of the year for the division winners, and if you picked the Mets, to win the East, you pick the uh, the St. Louis Cardinals to win the Central, and you pick the San Diego Padres to win the West. Those would be considered solid picks. Now, I happen to have picked Atlanta to win the East, but I did pick St. Louis to win the Central because I felt they were the only team that was trying. And I thought this was the year that the Padres were going to leapfrog the Los Angeles Dodgers and win the division. Uh, little did I know that this would be the year that the Diamondbacks would show up as they they doubled up the Nationals yesterday, 10 to 5. And that was significant because the Dodgers lost a walk-off game to Jeff Carr's team, the Cincinnati Reds. And it was a strange game. I was watching the game. And Dave Roberts let poor Caleb Ferguson pitch out there it was so obvious that he had no control. It was so obvious that I mean, he was walking batters, he was hitting batters, he was getting flustered. And then when he hit the batter with the bases loaded to tie the game, then he took him out. And I remember thinking, hey, Dave, if you had a pitcher ready, uh, I know he's faced at least three because the bases are loaded. Why did he, Why did he wait until the game was tied? And then I don't remember who he brought in, but the poor schmuck let up a, a fly ball that ended the game. But yeah, with that loss, the Dodgers fell out of first place. But at least the Dodgers are still a good team. The we are right now. It is a. I'm recording this on the seventh day of June. I was going to uh, record this uh, last night, but I just I was too tired. I actually started recording. And I was like, I, 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 my voice was gone. I had to go to bed. So I'm recording this in the morning of the 7th. If you had told me on the morning of the 7th day of June that the worst team in the National League, and I'm using wins and losses as the metric because that's the metric that everyone uses for entrance into the playoffs, the worst record in the National League, belongs to the St. Louis Cardinals, the one team that I felt was actually trying in this division is in the basement, not just of the Central, but in the whole National League. Now, the Cardinals should be grateful that the Oakland A's exist because there's no way they're going to hit the bottom of that giant trench. But still. When they went into this year looking like the only team that was actually putting a contender on the field, I didn't, you know, I, I, there was a possibility, of course, going to this year that the Cardinals were going to have a regression from last year's divisional championship. But we are now 62 games in the season. There's 100 games left, and it's easy to sort of calculate what these teams have to do when you've got 100 games left. Nice round number. 62 games into the year, the Cardinals are 25 and 37. I'm looking over here because I got a spreadsheet set up here from as my notes. Cardinals with a rotation. If you look at it, there's some good pitchers in that rotation. They're two MVP candidates. Lots of great young players coming up through there. The worst team in the National League at this moment. They have 100 games left to play. Oh, but there's more. The Padres, the team that I picked to go to the World Series are 10 games under 500. And the New York Mets, with their uh, fall from grace that they had last night, are now a sub-500 team with the largest payroll in the history of baseball. And both the Mets and the Padres have all-star managers who have won multiple managers of the year. And we're sitting here with those three teams, the Padres have 100 games left. 
The Cardinals have 100 games left. The Mets have 101 games left. Okay. Keeping that in mind, yes, teams can turn around. We've seen that in the last bunch of years. The Nationals turned around. The Braves turned around. The Phillies turned around. Three, the last three full 162-game seasons had National League teams that were not good at this point who went on to go to the World Series. Two of them won it. Well, if the Mets, Cardinals, or Padres want to join the Nationals, Braves, and Phillies on that route, they got to get their act together now. There's a lot of time. 100 games. Now, let's just say to at least punch your dance card to go to the postseason this year, let's be generous and say 90 wins will do the trick. That may not be the case, by the way. If Milwaukee and uh, Pittsburgh continue to play well, it may take more than 90 games, but let's just make it, you know, we got round numbers here. Let's say 90 wins. If you win 90 games with an expanded playoffs and don't make the postseason, then it's hat tip time. All three of those teams I just mentioned are sub-500 as of this recording. In order for the Mets to get to 90 wins, they have to go 60 and 41. They have to play, then that's a winning percentage of 594. They have to play 594 baseball the rest of the way. Can they do that? Sure. They have the talent. They have the payroll. They got the pitchers. They just have to start putting wins together they have to start winning these games but yeah they're they're possible to do that in order for the Padres this team that will look kind of Miami Heat uh super team you know when LeBron and Wade and Bosch were together oh they're putting together all the stars they brought in Bogarts they brought in Soto they brought in Machado they have Tatis there Oh, they keep bringing in players. It's, uh, they brought in Bogarts. It's not fair. Really? It's not fair? What's not fair is that team's 10 games under 500. And in order for that super team, and by the way, I praised them like hell in the offseason for putting together this team. In order for that super team to reach 90, they have to play, they have to go 64 and 36. They have to play 640 ball the rest of the way. That's a really high winning percentage, which means they have to start doing that now because that's over 100 games now. They have to start going on a big roll and playing like an elite team. If you win, if you, and then, of course, the Cardinals. Remember the Cardinals? The one team that I thought was actually trying in this division? They have to play 650 ball if they want to reach 90 wins. Now, 650 ball, if a team that plays 650 ball over 162 games is a team that would win 105. So from this point forward, they have to play on the level of a 105-win team in order to reach 90 and, and have their punch card for the postseason. There's a lot of baseball left to be played. But for those three teams that were borderline consensus picks to be playoff teams, they have to start doing that now. They can't fall any further. Because if they fall any further, then you have to say, oh, they have to win seven out of ten for the rest of the year. Not in chunks. For the rest of the year, they have to win seven out of ten if they continue to fall in June. Start playing well or start making your golf plans. So we're going to talk a little bit about why you don't record podcasts too far in advance when you start doing this. But let's first talk about better help. Look, I am someone who I've gone through therapy. I have been in therapy. And therapy is a positive thing. There should be no stigma upon that. It's If you're sick in other parts of your life, you go to the doctor to treat that. If you need help mentally, you got to get your mental help. And it's so easy to get caught up in what other people need in your life. As I mentioned before, I'm a special education teacher and I give and give and give. That's part of the deal when you do this as a living. But sometimes you don't have the balance in your life where you take care of yourself. Now, 
this is where better help comes into play. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online. It's designed for your convenience. It's flexible and you can make it suitable for your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And if you need to switch therapists, you can do that anytime. And there's no penalty. There's no additional charge. You need to find more balance in your life. And you can do that with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash MLB today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash MLB. Sometimes when you know you have a lot of things going on in your life, um, you sometimes try to record a podcast when you're doing a daily show. Sometimes you try to record a couple of things in advance. And I had dropped a couple of episodes recently. And I think this is my fourth episode already this week, and it's only Tuesday. But Millard and I recorded, Millard Thomas and I recorded, and then the Pirates uh, had their great game, and I had a chance to do the show with Ethan Smith, and that also dropped as the Lockdown Pirates episode. And I said, hey, why don't I drop that episode, the Pirates episode with Ethan, and the episode that I had recorded beforehand with Millard, I'll hold off on that one. I didn't want two dropping at the same time. And I said, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drop the Millard episode in the afternoon. Why am I telling you the behind the scenes stuff of the drops of these episodes? Because I thought I patted myself on the back and said, hey, look at that. I'm ahead of the game. Sully's ahead of the game. And I, and I put it so it would drop in the afternoon. I went off, did the things I need to do because I have a life as well. The minute the episode that Millard and I recorded where we talked about Jacob deGrom and the fact that he's on the 60-day DL, but that doesn't mean his season's over. And if he's at the end of the year and he comes off the 60-day DL and the Rangers continue to be a playoff team, that might be a secret weapon that suddenly you have a recovered deGrom to be used as a weapon in the postseason. What happened? The minute it said published, Jacob deGrom was announced he was going to have Tommy John surgery. It could not have timed better. I think they were synchronized. Bing! Sully and Miller talk about how Jacob deGrom could be helpful in 2023. Bing! Jacob deGrom's 2023 is over. Even I wasn't expecting that, and I have, uh, uh, and I did not feel confident about Degrom going into this year. Um, look at, again, I cannot stress this enough. I'm not gloating. This actually makes me sad. Baseball is better with Jacob Degrom playing. It really is. And you know, you just you knew the risk. And by the way, the Rangers knew the risk as well. And they put, according to an article I read in the Wall Street Journal this morning, they put all sorts of precautions and safety precautions financially in their in the contract. They're insured. And by the way, the Rangers are owned by billionaires. You know, that you sign Jacob deGrom. And I do not begrudge Jacob deGrom for getting the contract that he got. He put up great, great numbers earlier in his career with the Mets where he was not paid like an elite pitcher. And now, if anyone grumbles about, you know, DeGrom taking millions of dollars, as is his want, um, you know, it, it, you know, it evens out. A lot of times these things even out. But the fact of the matter is, with Tommy John surgery, as someone in their mid-30s, um, that's not good. That's not good. And there's a possibility, we know Best case scenario. Best case scenario. If we got a genie involved in this, DeGrom's not coming back till next year's All-Star break. All-Star break of 2024. And with this kind of you know, Tommy John at this point in your career, um, there's a real possibility that, you know, he may not come back next year. Now, if you look at his contract, he's got like $40 million coming up the next couple of years. It's between, you know, 37 and $40 million 
for DeGrom for the next bunch of years. That's a big pile of money. We all know that. Now, remember that DeGrom was the rookie of the year in 20, uh, in, was it in 2014? And in 2015 and 2017, uh, DeGrom was a elite pitcher. He was a Cy Young contender in 2017. He made $4 million that year. Now, yes, you and I would be more than happy to get $4 million. Hell, I would take the $556,000 he made in his rookie year. That being said, he put up numbers that would that are elite Cy Young numbers early in his career and was not paid elite money. Now, the Mets didn't have to pay him that money. But if anyone grumbles about the fact he's going to make $30 million here, $40 million there, the Mets got Cy Young caliber DeGrom for far less prices. He put up that sort of productivity and was not paid like a pitcher who put up those kind of numbers. So if he has years where he's hurt and being paid like an elite pitcher, it's called the universe aligning. It's making up for lost time. I do not begrudge Jacob deGrom for collecting the money that he earned. And maybe, just maybe, his presence on the team may have been part of the jolt that got this Rangers team that I had very little trust in going into this year to suddenly become a playoff contender. I think a lot of that had to do with Bochi. And I don't 100% remember the chronology. Did they sign Bochi before DeGrom or DeGrom before Bochi? But either way, there's a chicken or the egg going on there. And the culture has changed pretty much in Texas. And certainly, Yovaldi has been holding up his end of the bargain, as has Gray. Wouldn't it be wild if DeGrom gets his ring with the Rangers while sitting on the disabled list? There'd be almost something poetic about that after all the years in New York where you know, some of those years he won the Cy Young Award with absolutely zero run support. I digress. So, Tommy John for DeGrom. Lesson learned for your pal Sully. Don't drop these episodes too soon. Um, last year, Alec Manoa. I mean, this is another weird thing. Then this is, I guess, there is sort of cautionary tales about wanting to sign ace pitchers. You know, DeGrom had several years, you know, two Cy Young Award winners, multiple all-star teams. Uh, last year, Alec Manoa looked like he was the next great ace in the American League. In fact, he was a Cy, he was a Cy Young finalist. He was personally my pick, not that anyone cares, but he's personally my pick last year to have won the American League Cy Young Award. Went to Justin Verlander, and, you know, there's no shame in Verlander winning. I mean, he had a fine year with the Astros, and so it's not like they gave it to a chump. But you took a look at Manoa, who threw 196 and two-thirds innings, uh, had the low ERA of 2.24, uh, great strikeout-to-walk ratio. He was my Cy Young candidate for last year and had a terrific rookie year, too, where he, you know, he started 20 games. He had a good record, but he had a low ERA through a bunch of innings, and going into this year, I felt that the key for the Blue Jays would be to see how some of their pitchers like Bassett and um, uh, Gosman pitched, and if Jose Barrios and Yusei Kikuchi could turn it around, they had the possibility of a terrific five-man rotation. Well, as it turned out, Gosman has been fantastic. He pitched a great game the other day. Bassett's been solid. Barrios has been pretty good. And Kikuchi has been okay. So if you had told me all of that with the knowledge that Alec Manoa was going to be the next great ace of the American League, you would assume that the Toronto Blue Jays were running away with it. Ah, but here's the deal. I didn't take in mind that Manoa would have a horrible start. I don't like to look at win-loss records. I mean, Jacob deGrom is the poster boy of, you know, a, what's the word, a deceptive win-loss record. But a 1-7 record catches your eye, especially on a good team. 
the 6.36 earned run average and the fact that he has only 42 strikeouts, um, uh, 42, uh, 48 strikeouts in his 58 innings. His ERA plus is 65. That's terrible. And Manoa's last bunch of innings, he didn't get out of the first the other day. And that's scary for Toronto. Now, as it turns out, Toronto is going to actually send him, you know, he has options left. They're sending him back to extended spring training. They're sending him back to, uh, where are they, in Dunedin? I can't remember where in Florida. But they're, they're sending him back there as if to say, let's just, let's just pretend this didn't happen. Let, you know, and I've I've done that with my students sometimes. If something bad has happened, said, walk out the door and come back in. Let's just pretend that didn't happen. And so he's basically going back to spring training. And they have to put someone else in the rotation. But, I mean, anyone they put in can put up the numbers he was putting up at this point. Now, there have been instances where a player kind of looks lost at one point and they get sent back down or they have to, you know, get all caught up again. And they turn it around. John, that happened with John Smoltz with the Braves, and he went on to the Hall of Fame. Roy Halladay was sent back down to the minor leagues at one point, got his pitches together, and then he also went to the Hall of Fame. It's possible. Absolutely, it's possible. It's just startling when that happens. It's absolutely startling. And quite frankly, if... Manoa can get his head to you know it can just I don't want to say get his head together it makes it sound like I'm I'm degrading someone mentally but there's some block because he's clearly a talented pitcher and he just maybe he's just in the wrong groove and if they can turn it around for him that would be a gigantic thing for the Blue Jays it would be like trading a bad pitcher for good Alec Manoa. Maybe he just needs to feel more comfortable on the mound. Maybe he needs to be more comfortable when he's no longer on the field. If he needs to be more comfortable, can I recommend that he start wearing bird dogs? Let me tell you something. I wear shorts. I wear shorts now. But sometimes khaki shorts, I don't know. They don't look great. Sometimes they don't feel great. And you want to wear shorts that feel like, you know, something comfortable like you'd wear at the gym. But bird dogs, they have these stretch khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg and give you a great sculpted look. They do the same thing as Lululemon, but way, way better fitting. Guess what? They fit better than regular shorts. And they're not made of that stiff, restricting cotton. Come on, Alec Manoa, get your bird dogs. They invented a cloud knit fabric. Do you know what that means? I don't know, but it looks just like khaki and it stretches so you can get a slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. And as anti-stink sweat fabric that guess what I need, we all need, I bet Alec Manoa needs. It helps you keep cool and dry all day long. Now, look it. You got to do this, Alec Vanola. You got to wear these bird dogs. You got to feel comfortable. You look good. And guess what? You can go to birddog.com slash locked on MLB and enter promo code locked on MLB for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. For a free Yeti-style tumbler. Alec Manoa, do it! You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. Uh, Aaron Judge is on the DL. Or, yeah, I mean, old habits die hard. Some people have trouble remembering Cleveland Guardians. I have a hard time um, remembering it's no longer disabled list. And as a special ed teacher, you think I would make a note of that. The injured list. Um, I don't did he do it while crashing against that wall in the Dodger Stadium? I don't know, but once again, the argument for Aaron Judge being the American League MVP is very strong because when Judge was out of the lineup earlier this year, the Yankee offense was zero. You put Judge back, abundant. 
You take Judge out again. They were no hit by Lucas Giolito for six innings. So, and they, they weren't no hit at, by the end, but still it was, uh, it was not pretty if you were a Yankee fan yesterday's game. So they lost, but we got a slate of games going on today. And I won't drop an episode too fast because you know what? News comes at you really fast right now. Hey, let's do our trivia question for today. And I went around trying to find one and trying to see if I could find one that maybe, just maybe Craig Brindle wouldn't know right off the top of his head. Okay. And this I got from the uh, Sabre.org website. Who is the only player in Major League history to hit a walk-off inside the park Grand Slam? A walk-off inside the park Grand Slam was hit by this player. Who was it? So send in your answers, and I'll read off the first one either here uh, on the YouTube comments, or you can send it to Sully Baseball on Twitter, uh, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram, or you can send it to Locked On MLB Pods. Make sure to follow us. Make sure to listen and subscribe. We've got a bunch of cool shows coming up, including Jason Burke of Locked On A's. It's going to be on. And we're going to be discussing the, let's be frank and call it the fiasco of the A's, Vegas, and all the other stuff that's happening there. Talking about DeGrom, Manoa, and three teams that have to start putting on their aft thrusters now if they want to reach that 90-win mark and play in October. This has been Locked On MLB for the 7th day of June 2023. I'm the man behind the glasses. My name is Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me what? Oh, you can call me Sully.